the barbered, you see, right? Um, uh, we have a another seminar next Friday by Yaron Singer, one of the professors here at the computer science. He is talking about information diffusion through adaptive seating. Basically, he's asking the question, why don't we have friends? Um, and I told Yaron, you're in the engineering school. What do you expect? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he's not here now. <laughs> next week, we hear that. Uh, follow that is going to be Hartley Wickman expressing yourself in R. Another question why we don't have friends. Um, anyways, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Devavrat. We have a couple, an hour discussion earlier. It was very vivid, and we have a lot in common. He received his bachelor at the, tech, uh, the in technology computer science at the Indian Institute of Technology. He's sticking with the Institute of Technologies. <laughs> then he went to go to Stanford University. He did his PhD in computer science in 2004, and now he's. Uh, Associate Professor at MIT, again the IT. Uh, he's a <laughs> member of every lab in MIT, uh, Decision <laughs> System, Operational Research and Computer Science, Artificial Intelligence. And impressively enough, he got the best publication in applied probability between 2010 and 2013. Uh, his current research is in uh, large-scale machine learning and social data processing. Today he's going to talk about crowdsourcing, but he changed his title a little bit and about social data processing. I think he has a lot to say, so I don't want to take more time. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be uh, uh, here. It took me, uh, uh, I had to take quite a few flights to come here. <laughs> uh, of course, it's a joke. Uh, so it's, it's, it's even sweeter because when you can just drive from your office and it takes uh, no more than 12 minutes to come here. What I'm going to talk about is social data processing. Uh, as you might have seen the announcement, the announcement said something about crowdsourcing. So definitely I'm going to talk about crowdsourcing. But I thought uh, while going through my slides last evening and I realized that maybe it, should, it would be a good idea uh, given the nature of the, the seminar that let me just build a brief context and let me tell you where I'm coming from for that particular topic and what are the other interesting related questions that might uh, interest some of you. So the question that I want to discuss is social data processing. Uh, s one question is what is social, and second is what, data, what aspects of data processing. As the talk will proceed through two examples, I'll make it clear what I mean by them. Uh, at some level, it's an exciting uh, time here because we have lots of uh, social data through various sensors, if one might say. And the question is that sort of, we can make lots of interesting decisions using them. Uh, so that's a great positive side, that's opportunity. The issue is that it's a lot of messed up data and there's only so much structure that we have. So it's a challenge. And these are, this is the great thing to do, right? I mean, there's an opportunity, there's a challenge. If we can't solve it, who else would take? So I want to discuss some of those things. Let me sort of um, be, uh, uh, just at a high level, tell you what I mean by social data. It's a data that is gathered by us could be gathered in the context where uh, you swiped your credit card and hence I know what you did. Or it could be in the setting where you went on Yelp and you uh, posted your reviews. Or you watched movie at Netflix and through that implicitly you told me what things you like and what you, things you don't like. It could be tweets, or your phone traces, well that's a no-no now. <laughs> um, a crowdsourcing platform that I'll spend some time uh, discussing. And of course then there's all sorts of other things. Now, in some sense, so much of data that we have right now, uh, at, at some level, it's like our social DNA or our cultural DNA is sitting there. So if I were really clever and I knew exactly what each, each, each bit meant, potentially I could figure out sort of uh, how many people are there, what did you do in, during the day, et cetera, et cetera. For example, there's this nice website. Uh, I don't sure, I'm not sure if I should call it nice, but let's say it's a nice website which does the following. If I type your name there, then it will tell, you, tell me precisely which properties you spent your time in the last 15 years, which means that sort of which places you lived, rented, owned, et cetera, et cetera. And it provides pretty accurate information about me, and that was pretty scary. The point is that sort of the data is out there, so there's a lot of information. Maybe some of the reasonable things to do are following. If I'm thinking from a, a business a commerce perspective, of course, there's a lot of value to this. You can tell me what things I should buy, what things I should sell, what things I should advertise, et cetera. 
uh, if I'm thinking of uh, making uh, social or policy decisions, uh, for example, if I'm sitting in Washington and I want to decide uh, whether I should uh, plan my certain aspects of budget to make certain type of decisions versus, versus other, if I have data that might tell me that, sort of, well, people might like to use public transportation more than, the, uh, than otherwise, so maybe I will invest into that infrastructure rather than the otherwise. So naturally, uh, knowing about people's choices can help us do lots of uh, wonderful things. And finally, uh, I mean, this could really sort of uh, help uh, uplift society. So uh, I do believe at some level that things like crowdsourcing systems are very helpful in at least uh, mobilizing aspect of labor, labor force that we could not do before. For example, if you uh, go to uh, certain Southeast Asian countries, there people can earn reasonable wages uh, through answering uh, simple menial tasks on online crowdsourcing platforms that they could not do before. And definitely before they did not have any choices to earn wages, now they have. So clearly this is a useful thing. Now, of course, it doesn't answer, uh, doesn't provide answers for all labor forces, but it's a good start. Okay. So I think there's a huge potential here. And if I wanted to realize this potential, I need to do something about uh, data processing. Okay. Now, at a high level, in my mind, uh, any reasonable data processing system broadly divides into three pieces. Uh, piece one, which is how do I sense information from uh, people? Okay. In some cases, you are already given the sensing platform. In some cases, you have a choice to design it. You have a choice to maybe partially change it. So that's one piece. The second piece, once you have data, you want to sort of make uh, intelligent inferences out of it. Okay. And that's the processing piece. And the third is this is going to happen at scale, so you'd better worry about what sorts of uh, computational system or architecture that you're using. And uh, the way in modern computational architecture systems are there, that in some sense restricts what sorts of processing I can do. I can't solve, go and solve the hardest computer science problem like three satisfaction, for example. My computation is restricted because I want to do it at scale. So that means that I need to worry about what sorts of algorithms I need to design. But if I have to worry about what sorts of algorithms I need to design, maybe I need to worry about a good sensing platform that I, so that I can get good in, amount of information already so that simple algorithms can give me meaningful answers. So sometimes it's a loop, and uh, any reasonable system design ought to iterate through it. And you've got to start from somewhere, and that's what we'll do in the next few examples, okay? All right, so just to quickly explain what, um, um, what, is this, what are the sort of the two questions that broadly fit into these kind of uh, uh, social data, data processing realm. Uh, they're closely related, uh, and both of them are effectively in one way to look at it, the crowdsourcing question. Okay. So let's consider the following uh, situation. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I want to um, okay, I want to figure out what are the top ten restaurants in Boston. Okay, and um, I'm going to speak about that here, and I'm going to speak about it in the next scenario. Okay, because they actually are the same questions. One option is that well we asked different people about uh, choices of two restaurants or three restaurants. They provide me noisy information about it, and then I aggregate that information together and finally build a list of top 10 restaurants. Okay. Let me ask you another question, which is like this only, but it's in a very different context. Uh, let's imagine for a second that I am uh, in a hospital uh, because it's next day after my shoulder surgery, which actually happened in last October. And now, the morning I wake up, after a reasonable amount of pain, uh, the first thing happens is uh, a nurse visits me and they provides me my painkillers. After that, uh, the first uh, a medical resident walks in and sort of takes my history and asks me, what's my pain? On scale one to 10, I give number five, okay? Uh, a few hours later, later, I have breakfast and so on, maybe I'm feeling really jovial. And fellow comes in, asks the same question, I say four. A few more hours go by and now I'm really bored to death. And maybe my pain has started increasing also a bit. Um, a, a team of medical students come in and ask me a question, I say eight. And I say, why are you annoying me? Bring me the doctor. And then doctor comes in and my temporary response is six and a half, okay? What's really the right answer to my, the question that sort of, what's my pain, right? 
bottom line is that whenever you are taking these kind of public surveys, uh, be about individual or be about uh, some public uh, task at hand, different people will have different answers. They're not absolutely right, but they're noisy answers. So I'm getting noisy answers for different things. And my goal at the end of the day is to make a consistent picture out of these noisy answers, right? And this is the type of questions that uh, I'm thinking of in a scenario one. And here are different examples in which this can happen, right? So one last example is whether a website is suitable for children or not. And I'm going to ask this question to a bunch of people. Depends on which culture you come from. Okay. And uh, so that, that could be a noisy setting. And now I want to sort of aggregate that information to make meaningful answers. Okay. That's the first scenario. Again, classically, I would think of it as the surveys. In a modern world, I would think of it as a crowdsourcing settings. Here's another one. Again, it's like survey-like, but uh, with a different twist. A recommendation, going back to the ranking question. Okay. Um, different people watch different movies, and uh, given what your preferences are based on the little bit of history I have, I want to figure out what are the other movies that you may like that you have not watched. Okay. Similar thing about restaurants. It's the same question in the world of advertisements too, right? Uh, you as a, an online user come in, you're giving me some cookie data on you, which is preferentially a little bit of browsing history about you. Maybe I know some uh, uh, geographic information, which zip code you are coming from, et cetera. Based on that, I want to suggest, now that you're reading New York Times, maybe you're from Harvard, you're a scholarly person, not from MIT, the techie guys. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should recommend you a nice uh, a scholarly book rather than telling you how to fix nuts and bolts. <laughs> well, I wish I knew that, but so then the question is, what, am, what good am I? But in any case, the bottom line is that in this case, uh, it's a question of understanding people's choices and then trying to uh, suggest what they may like or what they may not like. Okay. The high level, both of these questions in my mind fit into the same, que same uh, uh, umbrella. That is, it's a human-powered computation. They were coming from different flavors. And I'll treat them a little bit differently because the specif spec specifics to the problem are different. All right, so given these two scenarios which I want to discuss, uh, let's go back to our the box and let's ask questions. So what are the sensing questions here? What are the design of sensing platform? All right, so uh, again, the goal would be that I want to get input from people and I want to get as much information out of it from them as possible. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, give you one example of this classical survey types. It's a different one. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it actually happened in 2008. So um, uh, US Air Force lost a plane in 2008. Uh, actually, it's a, I should have used the recent <laughs> example. Ah, damn. Anyway, so <laughs> let's say uh, US Air Force lost a plane and lost, got lost in uh, Nevada. Of course, we can all connect it to the, what's happening on the news. Um, we are unable to find it. Uh, question is that why are we unable to find it? We've got satellites looking at all the regions. Well, satellites may look at the, all the regions, but we don't have clever uh, image processing algorithms that can pick things up from it. But if I have like lots of such images, there were uh, close to uh, 50,000 such images that they had released in 2008, and they asked people to help. Okay? You or I individually cannot go through 50,000 images, right? So what we can do is that we can assign different people few images. Let's say you come to a website and say that, well, I want to help. All right, I will release, let's say, three of these 50,000 images, and I, I give you some uh, tasks to do. Let's say here's a person one. So here's a person one who gets these three tasks or these three images to ask question. Does this have uh, debris of plane? Does this have debris of plane? Does this have a debris of plane? And so on. This is person one, person two, person three, and so on, okay? And uh, in a sense, what is the design question here? Well, my restricting to, for an individual having three images, that's not a really design question, that's just a human constraint. But the design question is that, where do I put these edge edges, right? For example, I could have asked this first person, this one, and that one, and that one, or some other thing. 
maybe the really poor design would be that I will give everybody just first three images out of 50,000. Then all I'm getting information from everybody about first three images is very bad design. So on the other hand, if I spread it out everybody too thinly, I might not get good amount of information for every image. So there's a trade-off, right? Is I want to spread people out, but I want to spread people out in a nice, interesting way. That's the type of uh, question we have to answer. Okay, and let's say in this kind of scenario, what might happen is that uh, we might get answers like this. So for example, for this image from three different people, we get no, yes, no. This might say no, and this might say yes. So these are easy decisions, but this is a tougher one, or this is a tougher one. In this case, what should I do? I've got conflicting answers. Here also I've got conflicting answers. So this is where I need clever algorithms to tell me somehow, that, well, in this case I think it's wrong, in this case I think it's right, or in this case I think it's wrong. Because these two people who answered question, for some reason I know that they're very bad at answering questions. It's this person I really trust who's really good. So maybe I should trust this person. So how am I going to figure these things out? That's the intelligent processing piece. Okay? And those are the things I want to answer uh, in this scenario. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, describe you simple algorithms, and I will ask you to trust me that these are some of the best things you can do. Okay? And um, hopefully you will ask me questions and stop me saying that, well, why do you think that those are the best things to do? And there will be a great question. Uh, okay, here's another example going back to this ranking world. And um, there the situation would be that, well, I have three options, think of 10 or 1,000 in case of Boston restaurants. And I'm trying to figure out, well, uh, how am I going to seek people's input to rank order these 1,000 things? And how am I going to sort of uh, aggregate once I have people's input? All right, I mean, again, coming back to my, uh, uh, my personal medical history and uh, shoulder surgery, uh, even now I have to meet my doctor. He's a fantastic guy, he's a Harvard guy, uh, practices at Brigham's, and um, uh, every time I meet him, Dr. Higgins, uh, he asks me questions, so how's your pain feeling? And I tell him, well, let me remind myself that last time I told you it was number seven, and I think I want to convey to you that it's better, so I'll tell you six. I mean, it's like sort of uh, asking people questions like this, right? Uh, tell me what are the hex, hex code of these two blue colors. I mean, they're given there. <laughs> I hope they make sense to you. They don't to me. Uh, but instead, sort of, I asked you questions like this, right? That uh, tell me which one of this is more blue, which is what my uh, optometrist would do, right? Or optician would do to sort of figure out what's my power. And in that case, things work well. So really, if I want to get people's input about ordering, maybe a better way to ask question to them or design my uh, input-seeking platform is to ask them questions about comparisons rather than numbers, okay? But once I get comparisons, I can have issues. I can have issues like somebody said A better than B, somebody said B better than C, somebody said C better than A. Okay, now I'm in trouble. How am I going to process this? If you had given me numbers, life would be simple, right? I would just average the numbers and then that's rank order. I just put myself in trouble for no good reason now. Okay, so that's a question we want to answer because this is a good way to gather people's input. So let's figure out a way to process it. Like, let's not design our systems so that machines can process them well. Let's design systems so that people can use it well. Okay? All right, so those are the two... Uh, uh, the two scenarios that I want to discuss. And now I want to spend the uh, rest of the time sort of talking about the processing pieces that I mentioned. Okay. Uh, let me sort of take a pause here. I'm uh, roughly 20 minutes in, and I'll set up the questions, set up the background. Now, if you have any sort of questions about sort of what I told you, feel free to stop me here and ask. I'm hoping that you're going to be an interactive crowd, at least in future. Okay, that was clear. Okay, so let's start thinking, sort of how do we think about this problem? At the, at the end of the day, I want to make decisions. In the first case, I want to figure out from noisy data, what are the right labels? That is whether an image has plain debris or not. 
In the second case, I have a bunch of pairwise comparisons. From that, I want to figure out ordering of things. Okay, so that's my decision I want to make. And I got data, Again, and data as I just mentioned. Um, now in this case, the problem, like most other cases, uh, data is noisy, so it's a statistical challenge, and it could be a lot of it, which means I need to design a computationally efficient system. Okay, I want to design a system that can scale well. Okay, and finally, to make an interesting decision, I want to design algorithms that takes me from data to decision, but somehow it's um, it's statistically founded. That is, I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing has some meaning to it. It's just not something that, oh, I think this is the right, and I'm going to put it out. Uh, putting it the other way, what I want to think about in these two contexts, what model makes sense that sort of helps me connect observations to the decision variables. Once I do that, then I can write down a reasonable optimization problem, hopefully. And once I know the optimization problem, I can write down the algorithm. And once I can do all that, it might be very complicated, so I'll write down a simpler version of thing that can I can implement, and then hope that while doing all of these things, I'm not lost faithfulness to the model. And actually, if I apply to some real real data, it'll give me some meaningful answers. Okay, all right. So that's the thing I want to do, and I want to do these two things. That thing for these two problems. Okay. All right. So again, just to remind ourselves, noisy answers or noisy labels or pairwise models. Those are the decisions I want to make, and I want to come up with algorithms that can, models that can help me design algorithms that eventually just takes me data to decision rather than worrying about model. Okay. So uh, here is the model that I want to describe for the first question. And this is uh, reasonably general, and uh, I'll let you decide that at the end of the day, of course. Uh, it's the model that was proposed by David and Skeen in the 70s. Uh, uh, so the reason sort of they have proposed this model so many years back, because crowdsourcing happened only now at some level, because they were actually worried about this medical history problem that I was describing to you. And uh, there's a beautiful paper that I wrote in the 70s and which described this model. So I'm going to specialize that model for this case. So the basic idea is this, that every worker or every individual whom we have employed for performing our task has some latent unknown expertise or skill or truthfulness parameter, okay? So for example, this worker has truthfulness parameter one. Okay? That means that whenever this person is asked question, she or he will answer it correctly, always. Okay? On the other hand, this person is gonna flip a coin at random, so it's like totally noisy. On the other hand, this person is, for me, as valuable as this person. Because every time, I, it's like, uh, if I want to get work done from you, I would say, don't do the work. That kind of a thing. All right, and then there's a whole uh, thing in the middle. So, so I have workers, they have latent, honest, your truthful parameters, which I don't know. And, but given that, they will provide me answers that will be correct with probability of their parameter. And this is an instance of David and Skeen model. Uh, David and Skeen model is generically applicable to most surveys that you can think of. Uh, the algorithms I'll describe here is, are very easily extendable for all those settings, but I'm not going to discuss that. Okay. You have a question? So you're that these things are fixed, so if you would provide incentives for them to uh, give them better answers? Or... Sure. So, um... Your mechanism in some way that affects these probabilities. Sure. So at the end of the day, uh, the way I want to think of the problem is as follows: that whatever answers I'm getting, those answers are coming from one worker or for a given worker. They're coming with some effective honesty parameter. Now it could be a parameter that's changed because of uh, money that you have provided or something else, or not. And I don't care about that. Because what I would really, at the end of the day, care is what is the aggregate quality of my crowd? And that will happen, we'll see as sort of we'll go through the process. And I would not need to know because there will be a way I would provide you a certificate that your algorithm will tell you, well, actually, I think you have inferred things correctly. 
Great question. Though. Okay, so here is just a formal model that I'm writing down there. Uh, if I ask a worker with honesty parameter pj, she answers it correctly with probability t correctly with probability tj, incorrectly with probability one minus tj. Okay. I'm going to assume that these answers are independent given these two things. And I'm going to assume that I know at a high level the following knowledge, that whether on average, whether my crowd is, uh, uh, on average, are they liars or are they uh, honest? Okay. Because it's like if everybody answered zeros, even though true things are one, or everybody answers one if true things are one, there's no way for me to differentiate between those two unless I know whether sort of people are more truthful or less truthful. Your question, please. Yeah, you know, I was hoping you'd give us a preview as to why it's a necessary assumption, but you did. Yeah, I mean, there's, if, you, if you can overcome that, is, that issue, then I think uh, you're good. Okay, so <clears throat> the first question that I had posed earlier was, how would I design my task assignment? That is, I've got tasks, and I've got people. Remember, 50,000 images, and I'm going to allow you to assign, let's say, three images per person. And let's say I also told you that you can assign three, three people per image. So let's assume that I've got 50,000 images, and I've got 50,000 people. And what I want to do is that to each person, I want to assign three tasks, and each task should be assigned to three people. Given this constraint, what is the best way to do task allocation? Answer is as simple as it gets. Do randomly. Okay, that is uh, one way to assign tasks is as follows. From these 50,000 things, you sample 50,000 times three images at random. Okay, and this just do repeat this experiment, this thing 50,000 times. Whatever those 50,000 things come out, assign to a number one to up to 50,000. There are other graphs that will work well, and uh, should have listed that. So, okay, so once you have uh, this task assignment done, you get people's answer, and now you want to decide what are the correct label for each task. Okay. What is the simplest answer you can give? Well, here's what you'll do. I'll look at a given picture or a given task, and I will see what are the labels I've got. Here I've got three labels, one plus and two minus. Uh, a simple majority rule says that, well, Two people are agreeing on minus and against one person, so I'm going to go with majority. And that's the simplest possible rule, right? And that's what I've written upstairs in a, just a formula form. Okay. Now, this is good if everybody's equally, equally truthful or equally uh, dishonest. But my crowd will have variation. And let's suppose for a second that I know that this person is 100% truthful, but these two have provided me answers at random. In that case, I should just ignore these two guys' answers, and I should just focus on this one, okay? Uh, which means that I know that P's. That is, I know in the first case, the P is one. In the other two cases, P is half, okay? And the statistically correct way to uh, put this is what I would call the maximum likelihood estimator. We'll say that, well, I should take the people's answer and weigh them by this number, and that number is a function of that truthful parameter. So for example, if my p is one, this value is log of infinity, which is infinity. Great, you just take that person's answer. But if p is half, then the um, answer I'm looking for is log of one, which is zero. I mean, I'll just ignore those people's answer. And then there's a whole, uh, a whole spread in between, right? For example, if my p is zero, what I would say is that do log minus infinity, which is saying that, sort of, uh, sorry, log, so minus log infinity, which is saying that, look, whatever you're saying, just invert it. Makes sense, right? Sorry? <coughs> maximum likelihood. Ah, so what I effectively did is I wrote down uh, uh, conditional probabilities. So there is given, assuming that I know what people's P's are, uh, no, no, no. Um, effectively, this comes out from, uh, it's, a, it's a cleaned up version, but it comes out from primarily 
the maximum likelihood uh, estimation. Okay. But it's just sort of, uh, I would written it this way because it sort of provides a nice interpretation. Okay. So what this suggests is the following, right? This suggests that, well, what I really want to do is given people's answers, somehow I want to figure out people's P's. Once I figure out people's P's, or if I could figure out their W's, I will weigh their answer by those W's and then sort of do that, uh, that thing. Okay, so, but then sort of how do I figure out people's Ws? Well, if suppose I knew that what is a true answer, let's say the true answer to task is plus. And let's, I, let's say sort of, I, uh, Paolo's answered me sort of three times minus. Clearly, he's, uh, his P is pretty low then. Okay? But on the other hand, sort of, uh, to do this, I need to know what are the true t answers to the task. So like, what I have got myself into is a chicken and egg problem, which came first. Okay, so that's one way to think of it. Another way to think of it is that, well, actually no. If I know people's P correctly, and if I know their estimations of tasks correctly too, then maybe given estimation of task corresponding P that I will estimate, or given P, the corresponding task answer I will estimate, they will be consistent with each other. Okay, so the whole question is sort of trying to look for that kind of a equilibrium or fixed point situation. Okay. Now, uh, when you do that, you can. Uh, so, sorry, again, the P is a half, right? Yes. And you get zero. That's correct. So that means you're not deciding? Mm, so you're not if, if all P's are half, that means that um, my it's zero. It's, not it's, it's zero. But if everybody voted one, that's correct. And we all have, you're making no decision. Good. So if if I'm a task yeah. to which there are three people assigned, two of them are zero and one of them is not zero. No, I say everybody is a half. If everybody is a half, that means that I've got zero information answer about me, which means that <laughs> all I should do is I should just choose an answer at random. A is the decision, right? No, A is the answer that you provide me, okay? Right, so if, if everybody says this is the no. plane, but so, we'll... No, so let, let's suppose this, right? Let's suppose these are the three people whose actual P, and let's say you are on Oracle, and you know that these, the way these guys answered this question is they were sitting on the side with, by flipping a random coin. And this guy gave me minus, minus, and plus. And so I know that these guys P are half. What should I do? I should ignore their answer. I should, what I should do in this case, I should also flip my own coin and say, let me take the answer. Okay. But on the other hand, if these two are flipping coins, but this guy was good, I'll just take that person's answer. So even if you have 100 votes and everybody says it's something, if you don't, if everybody's half, you say it's crap, I forget it, and I just do it. Okay. Absolutely. And so in some sense, this also raises an interesting question. Given the quality of crowd, how many minimum questions I must ask for a given task, okay? And once I have do that much amount of information seeked, can I sort of figure out answers correctly? That is a way to put, play, pose the question. And the algorithm that I'm going to describe you does precisely that. Okay. Um, and I hope this plot conveys you. So let's just sort of quickly sort of parse through this plot. What I'm saying is that, look, more redundancy I have, that is, for a given task, more number of answers I get, my probability of error should decrease, and this is decreasing exponentially, okay? And so this is increasing linearly, this is decreasing exponentially, which is good, okay? This is says that sort of if I knew the P's correctly, that P's are generated as per some distribution, then this is the best you can do. Nobody can beat this. But if you did something like majority, which is very simple, you will do terribly. And this, should, this you should read as terrible, because remember, this is an exponential curve. But if you did an algorithm that I'm going to describe you in a second to iteratively estimate this and then this, then it's going to effectively do as good as this guy. Have any prior or it's uniform? How, I mean, you here you, in this example, you assume that you've already computed P. 
but in general, you got to work with. Stuff. No, so the way to think of this is workers are bringing their uh, honesty parameters, okay? Right. And once it's given, effectively, their distribution over P's is the my effectively distribution. Okay. And I don't care what that is. Okay. All I'm going to care about is some one parameter, okay. so yes, which is, yeah. have Okay, so let me just describe you how roughly the algorithm works. And this is as intuitive as it gets. So let's suppose that at some point of time, remember this fixed point thought process? I, I'm just writing, opening up those equations here. Okay. Let's say at some point of time, so I'm a, I'm a task and these are workers, okay? And let's say my task is as answered by four workers. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. First, I'm gonna say that, well, look, I'm a task I, and I, want to tell you as a worker J that look, what I think is your, uh, how, go how good you are. One way for me to tell you is the following. I'm gonna take answers from all other people that effectively tells me what should be my real value, let's suppose for a second. Then I'll compare it with what answer you've provided me. If it matches, I'll boost your value. If it does not match, I'll reduce your value. Okay. One way to do that is as follows. So somehow you guys conveyed me your reliability. Okay. Then I know what answers you gave me. So I will add those things up. And then th this, through this, I'm going to send you what I think is my likelihood. So let's say if this is a very large positive number, then it's like saying that I think I'm like really plus one. If this is really large negative numbers, I'm saying that I'm really negative number. Once a worker, let's say, receives that kind of number from different tasks, then it multiplies those likelihoods that different tasks has provided to it. It multiplies with its own answer, and then sends it to the task. So it's like I'm iterating. So let's just, let me repeat it once now with some exa uh, example numbers. Initially, let's suppose that every worker starts with their uh, reliability, which is W equal to one. Every worker, because I don't know to begin with. Okay. Then what these workers will do, this, this guy will do is that let's say, plus one, minus one, minus one, it will send an answer here, minus one. Okay. Let's suppose that this guy got a minus one here, plus one here, and plus one here. Okay. So this is minus one, plus one, plus one, and this guy answered minus one for this, minus one for this and minus one for this. That means that in one case there was agreement, in two cases there was disagreement. So this will become a minus one because I've got some disagreements. And then that will send me, next iteration it will send that my reliability is minus, don't trust, start, stop trusting me now. On the other hand, if there are lots of agreements, let's say my answer minus one, plus one, plus one, which means three, I'm gonna send you well, actually, in three cases, I believe I'm in agreement. So my value should be three. And so this could boost up or this could go down. So this is an iterative algorithm. And after some iterations, you stop, and based on what value you are receiving at each task, you decide whether some of the value that you're receiving is plus or minus, and then you make your estimate. Yes? This looks a lot like the loop propagation. Oh, fantastic. So how did the algorithm come about? Uh, intuitive explanation came later, so I like wiped out all my tracks. So he's absolutely right. This is, um, so if I, okay, a key word, Zara, if you want to look it up, is that one way to think of this inference problem is a graphical model inference. If I put certain prior called Haldane priors on my worker's uh, uh, honesty parameters, then whatever belief propagation I write down, instead of it being an uh, algorithm with continuous functions being passed around, it is only sort of uh, one number that's being passed around. And then you quantize it a bit. That gives me this algorithm. And your graph is sparse enough that you don't have a lot of loops in there? Uh, since it's a random regular graph, um, uh, it is locally tree-like. Now, the second question you're raising is that what if uh, graph actually is a spectral expander, in which case it might have loops? Well, uh, I don't have the equations here, but if you, let's say if you twist your eye a bit, 
and forget about this not equal, right? Then, and then sort of put this iteration twice along with this one. Then on T, this is AA transpose. So actually I'm computing uh, a singular vector of uh, the matrix A. And there is a, um, for all spectral expander, you can argue that this algorithm is effectively computing, uh, effectively doing a power iteration and then sort of the singular vector turns out to be the right approximation. Anyways, that's uh, it's a great question. And that also helps you sort of uh, establish the fact that this is information-wise, this is the best algorithm. There is nothing better than this you can do. Okay. Uh, all right, I uh, don't have a theorem statement because I thought it would be useful to just tell you the algorithms. Uh, I have one experiment that we ran on uh, Turk because we just wanted to figure out what the thing is. So here is the experiment I want to run. Right? Let's say here is one tie that I wanted to buy, but I can't buy those two, but here are two other ties that look like this. Tell me which one is similar. It's two, maybe ties are not the best idea. Maybe somebody should give a shirt. Here's a shirt, tell me which tie goes better with the shirt. But then the question is, I might get answers from people. How do I verify the correctness of that? because I'm running a test, an experiment, which for scientific purpose, right? I want to sort of see if my algorithm is good or not. So here we couldn't figure out. Finally, uh, we thought about running some experiments based on, um, uh, you know, I give you a, a sentence, and I tell you that sort of, uh, I give you sort of two error version of that. Okay, and then I tell you which one is more correct. Uh, how to first generate sort of the erroneous samples. So one thing we tried was, here's an interesting uh, sort of fun thing to do. Take an English language sentence, put it into Google Translate, translate it into French, take that, translate it back to English. You will get an error. Uh, but again, so either errors were so obvious or errors were not at all there, so it again didn't make sense for having a noise. So finally we went with this. Uh, so there is a notion of uh, visual similarity between colors and there's a well-defined metric that is just a, an affine transformation from RGB coordinates of colors to, so you can actually measure it. So here's what we did. We said, well, here is a color one. These are two colors. Tell me which one is closer to this visually. So we can verify these answers. And here is the type of experiments we get. Uh, as we increase the redundancy, our algorithm starts doing better. This is the majority voting, and this is what's known as EM algorithm, which I was hoping would do better than majority, but for some reason it's doing worse. And the uh, only explanation I have is that somehow it's just sort of denoising in the wrong direction. Okay. Uh, here it is linear as it, I can, I mean, the way it's, it's not. Okay. Um, if you sort of notice that there is a, some kind of a phase transition kind of thing happening here, and that actually if you calculate the, it's, it is the right uh, information uh, place. What happens is that up to some point, uh, since there is not enough information in the system, there's no point of running iterations. It's like you are aggregating noise. But after that, there is a value of running iterations. So before that, the majority algorithm makes more sense. After that, majority algorithm does not make more sense. All right, so I think I've exhausted uh, I've got roughly 10 minutes left, right? Can I go with, okay. So um, this is the experiment explaining that choice of precise good task allocation graph is necessary. Don't just do anything, actually have uh, good expanders. All right, so other question that I wanted to discuss was this question of ranking. Uh, again, just to remind ourselves, uh, I have situations like this, right? Um, in sports, for example, I have teams with wins and losses. Uh, in social setting, let's say I've got start data. In that case also, I know which one you like more over the other. For example, I think there's a cricket World Cup going on right now of the shorter format. And uh, let's suppose that India did beat, indeed, uh, England. In which case, I'll get a comparison like this. Uh, if you still hang around around MIT, there's two good coffee shops, and if I were to put uh, my ratings, they would look something like this, which would effectively convey that I like voltage more over that. And if indeed I were the one who were reviewing the papers associated with this thing, 
I would give myself 10 and maybe anything else, five. I'm sorry for the joke. But that would convey that my paper is better than the other. Bottom line is I've got objects. Depending on how you put inputs, at the end of the day, I could distill it into the bags of comparisons. And once I've got bags of comparison, I want to make uh, some kind of ranking or recommendations. Um, I'm going to discuss ranking piece, not recommendation. Ranking is something saying that I I'm interested in only one order. Recommendation is saying that per individual, I want to decide the best order. So it's like a Bayesian view rather than just a population view. Okay. Now, again, going back, I want to decide what is the right model that will relate my data to my decision of interest. Um, let me just open this up completely so it's easy for me to explain. Um, remember, we have data of this type. So let's say I've got A, B, and C, and I've got some data points looking like this. One way to think of these data points is they're coming from one fixed rational order. But then that will not allow me to sort of think of contradictions properly. So maybe the reasonable and right way to think of this is not that data is coming from one rational order, but over a distribution over rational orders, a distribution over permutations, or distribution or ordering. For example, this can be coming from A greater than B greater than C, and maybe this is coming from B greater than C greater than A, and so on. Which effectively say that, well, maybe this data is actually sampled from this kind of distribution that 75% people like this ordering, 25% people like this ordering. And if that is the case, maybe in this case, this is the winner. Okay. So if one thinks about this way, then the question boils down to, okay, given your pairwise observations, can I learn and fit a model to that? And then once I have the model, can I sort of use it to rank things? Um, for the purpose of ranking, uh, one reasonable model to think about is as follows. Look, I believe that I want to produce a ranking. If I believe that I want to produce a ranking, maybe the distribution I'm hoping for is, uh, is a kind of a unimodular distribution, where there is one, one ranking or few rankings like one ranking have most probability, and rest of them have fewer things. And I'm looking for that mode or that characteristic. So then one way to think of it is let me find out what are the distributions that have such characteristics over distribution or permutation, then learn the parameters from that, and from there I infer the ranking. And when one does that, is uh, the algorithm that I'm going to describe comes out, which we call rank centrality. So the way to think of this, uh, this, um, this data is I'm going to think of it as a graph. Uh, and let's say these are two teams which have played six times. Out of those six times, this team defeated that five times, and that team defeated this team one time. Okay? And not, all, not, all, not necessarily all teams have played with each other. And from there, I want to come up with some kind of a ranking. And the way I'm going to come up with a ranking is by uh, designing a simple uh, random walk over it. Okay. So to explain this algorithm, let's think of the following. Let's say there are only two players who are playing with each other. Okay. Um, um, let's say it's me and Paul. Okay. And let's say we played uh, chess 10 times. He won nine times. I won somehow one time. Okay. Clearly, he should be ranked higher than me, and he should be ranked significantly higher than me. So one way to assign scores is to say that, well, look, you played 10 times, so there was a 10 cookies available, out of which he won nine, so he takes away the nine, I get the one. So that means that one way to do normalized rank assignment is he gets 0.9, I get 0 0.1. Okay. Now let's think of the same one way to okay. One way to reach that thing is to design the following random walk. There's a, a random walk in which, at each time, I am either at my state or his state, and every time I'm making a random decision to either continue remaining at the state I am or jump to the next one. Okay. If I am at state which is me, I should jump from me to him with probability nine tenth, and with probability one tenth I should remain at myself. But I am him. I should remain at that state 9 tenth and 1 tenth I should jump. If I look at this random walk, run it for a long time, and see what fraction of time I'm at that state versus my state, it will be 9 is to 1. Okay. So that means this is a nice way to, uh, a random walk is a nice way to describe the division of uh, uh, scores or ranks. Okay. Now when I were to do the same thing over entire uh, 
and things, one reasonable way to do that is to do exactly what I said, but for every, every two edges, that I'm going to run a random walk over n nodes. And at any point of time, I jump from myself to one of my neighbors, proportional to how often that neighbor has defeated me to how often I have defeated that neighbor. Normalize it appropriately. Write down that random walk and look at long-term frequency. It will satisfy some such equation. That equation would, if I wrote down a more meaningful way, it would look something like this. My score is equal to the scores of people I have played games with and multiplied by the ratio of how often I have defeated them versus they have defeated me. So it's like, if I defeat a superstar once, I should be the world champion. But other way to become superstar is to play so many uh, different games and play with all the sort of intermediate people many times. So that's one way to think of this. Okay, and um, uh, here is uh, given sort of, I've already given it out to you that I do follow cricket. Uh, one way to sort of see what sorts of answers does it provide. So we took uh, data from two years of uh, 2012 and 2013 calendar year of international cricket and then looked at the, uh, there's a format of cricket called One Day International. You rank teams, so that's the international ranking. Uh, that's the ranking I would suggest. Um, and if you see, there's lots of similarities at most places, like top things are working fine as you would expect in any setting. It's this intermediate places where things are terribly off. For example, if you look at this one, like Scotland, Scotland won nine times, lost six times, and gets here rank 15 while there gets rank seven. Makes sense, right? I mean, look at this guy. This guy, is, this guy shouldn't be sitting here. Uh, now you can sort of ask question, well, but maybe it's like uh, the superstar defeating, defeating effect. Well, I know cricket. I looked at these precise games, and I would not sort of, if I were to give manually ranking, I would not rank Kenya over Scotland. And maybe I think uh, beyond this we can keep arguing. Okay. All right, so uh, what else would we, uh, there's an MIT admission systems where we use this as an advisory, some conferences and so on. And I think here's where I'm going to stop here and I'm going to uh, end with uh, this just one last message that look, these are great sets of questions, interesting opportunities, lots of exciting challenges. And at a high level, uh, what we need to think about is what are the right interfaces, what are the right models, and what are the right way to compute things. Okay, let me stop here. about the final question here that sounds fascinating. What do you mean by the question? Yeah, so I think, uh, um, uh, well, the great thing about sort of MapReduce style questions was sort of here are sort of class of uh, compute questions we want to do. And here is a type of uh, simple architecture in which everything would fit. Um, if I were to think of uh, statistical inference questions, maybe this is not the best compute architecture to scale. Maybe there is a different compute architecture that I would like to scale. Is it the graphical model style architecture? Not necessarily because it has its own issues such as uh, overloading things at few places, the bottlenecks. Um, but there is a sort of hope, right? That sort of, look, statistically we know that when I want to do some meaningful computation, if I'm doing computation in a reasonable dimensional setting, then I don't need to explore my terabytes of data simultaneously. I should be happy with even uh, a million records to get some low dimensional information. And if I'm iterating over low dimensional information, maybe then I should not think about uh, uh, thinking of, oh, I need to process all data simultaneously, but I'm happy to sort of shard data once and for all and then do something about it. Question is there a clean way to think about those questions so that I can write down one format in which I can put everything, I don't know. It's a bit uh, undefined question, but hope it conveys there. Yes. Uh, before this 
in the dynamic setting where uh, workers arrive over time, so maybe it's not obvious that you should use the random graph. Maybe Good question. You should choose so, a uh, okay, so let's um, uh, let me uh, paraphrase your question. Is that let's suppose that I have a choice of deciding whether for a given task I should ask more questions or not. Should I do things adaptively? Or should I do it in this one short way? Okay. Um, in the setting in which I was describing the uh, problem, where I don't have ability to choose one particular worker to work on my task, because I'm giving it out to a platform like a crowdsourcing platform, a worker might come maybe from a known quality distribution, but still, I don't know which worker I'm choosing. In that case, uh, here's a theorem that you can't do better than this, even with adaptation. It's a bit surprising, but it's true. I have a question about the uh, task allocation problem. Yes. So uh, if uh, there's only one uh, genius in that uh, rating system, and all the other are randomly choosing the answer, can you still get the oracle solution by iterative algorithm? What you're describing is that you're, you don't have information in the system. Can you extract information out of it? So answer should be no. Yes? For the satellite images in the planes, it looks like some were more difficult to decide if there's a plane or not. Do you model the inherent difficulty of the task? Excellent question. So now going to the generic David and Skeen model, where effectively all of these things would apply, there what you're saying is the following, that every task has some answer, some answer from some finite alphabet value, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Given the answer of the task, every worker has some confusion parameter. So in some sense, it's like uh, for every worker, there is if a number of different answers could be k, you got k by k confusion matrix, okay? Uh, this would work effectively on that problem uh, by doing uh, effectively a reduction, where you should view that problem as logarithm in k different binary problems, and then sort of run this algorithm and then fuse things. And for that reason, uh, you wouldn't be do, able to do better than this one. Okay. It's a great question. Yes? So you dealt with the reliability. How about bias? For example, if we ask these reliable crowd, University better Harvard or MIT. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a no, no, I mean, it's not only the reliability; it's the bias too, right? You deal with that. Then, then? Okay, so then, uh, e, so I'm trying to understand sort of how would I from formulate the bias, right? One way I would formulate the bias is going back to this confusion matrix thing. That is, depending on who is the person mm -hmm. and what is the task answer, my confusion will. Be changed, different. Right. No, and in some sense, giving the wrong answer may be wrong. You're just giving the wrong random answer, or you may always give one direction. And from what I see, there. So like not in this uh, not in simplified this symmetric model, but in general, general David and Skin model, I be believe that you can very easily incorporate it. Yes. Do you think there is any need for you to condition uh, the actual reliability of the person based on the number of tasks they view assigned to them? It's a good question, and I think uh, there, is a, there is a value to doing that, because if I assign you sort of 20 tasks, most likely after three answers, I should expect you random up. It's a, it's a great modeling thing to do. I don't think this does it. The like other piece that this doesn't do is that think uh, uh, cleverly and uh, nice ways sort of actually how incentive put in the system design piece. Uh, but this is not doing that. All I'm saying is that once incentives and everything is fixed, I know rough how noisy or how reliable crowd is, and then I will infer this. Uh, the other thing that sort of uh, statistically this doesn't have, for example, is when a person answers two tasks, that person's answers are conditionally independent given these latent parameters. Maybe they're dependent. Okay, thank you. Thank you.